Morning, guys. Thanks for, thanks for coming out. My name is Chris King. I'm from Redding, California. I work with a group of guys down there uh, called AC Fly Fishing. And um, I've been guiding for, uh, geez, 23 years now. Don't tell anybody. Um, <laughs> but uh, just love being out on the water, love running around, uh, love flinging flies through the air and, and making, uh, making fly lines do crazy stuff in, in, in the air. So uh, how many of y'all uh, were here yesterday? Yeah, quite a few of you. Good. How many spent the night? How many went to bed earlier than I did? <laughs> All of you, I bet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, hey, listen, what I want to talk about this morning, guys, is um, the, the presentation I'm going to give is called Breaking the Rules, right? So one of the things that's different between casting and fishing, right, is that we don't always have the perfect conditions like we have right here uh, when we're trying to make these casts. So Throughout our, um, you know, life as a spade caster and our evolution, you know, we go out, we fish, maybe we take a lesson, hopefully we take a lesson. We try to watch some videos and we try to go out and we try to emulate all these things that we've heard and that we've seen, right? So there are certain rules involved, things that everyone says, all the instructors say, all the guides will tell you, and um, certain things that have to happen during a spay cast in order for it to be successful. Can anybody think of any of those rules? Anybody? Come on, you're all spay casters, right? Who's a spay caster? Anchor placement. Okay, anchor placement. Where is the anchor supposed to be? Right, within a rod's length, right? Uh, if, I'm doing, if I'm doing a snap tee or a single spay upstream of my target, right? And everything is beautiful. If I'm doing, if I'm doing a double spay, right? Same thing, rod's length, but downstream of my target, and everything is beautiful, okay? So those, that's one of the rules. We're going to talk about that one. Uh, what's another one? What's the 180 degree rule? Anybody know what the 180 degree rule is? D-loop 180 degrees from your target, okay? So if I pick a target uh, across the river, let's say this bush that's starting to turn yellow here, when I form my D-loop, I should form it 180 degrees from that target, and everything is beautiful. I get a nice pretty cast, right? Um, what's another one? How about train tracks? Anybody know what train tracks is? That's very common, right? Train tracks is that everything should be in a line. So where your D-loop is set up, uh, the portion of the line that's on the water is in a straight line pointing towards your target, and your forward cast follows that straight line just to the side of it, and if you were to see it from above, it would make train tracks, right? You'd have your D-loop here, you'd have your forward cast or your forward stroke there, right? So those are some of the things that a lot of folks talk about that we all talk about in spay casting. Now, like anything in the world, right, most rules can be bent, some can be broken, okay? So that's what I want to talk about today. So to go over it, um, how many, like, beginner spay casters? Inter beginners, intermediates, advanced, just the two jokers in the back? Okay. So listen, um, so some of the things I want to talk about, uh, I'll explain it so that, you know, you guys that, that are just starting in spay casting, you'll understand the rules and what we're talking about. And for you intermediates, I want you to think about this stuff while you're on the water, because that's what's most important, right? So we all do this to go fishing, right? Anybody do this just to go win the distance tournament down in San Francisco? None of you, right? We all do this to go fishing. So let's talk about anchor placement first, okay? So in your fishing and in your practice casting, and I hope you guys practice cast, right, because you don't want to go out to the river and have, you know, a fish rolling that far tail out, and there's no way you can get there because you haven't picked up a spay rod in, in, you know, since six months, since the last time uh, Steelhead were swimming. So um, we talk about anchor placement, and it's very important to be able to vary your anchor placement uh, knowing that you're bending one of those rules and that the ultimate result could be better if it were in place. You guys follow that? Okay, so if I put this, just a switch cast here, and a switch cast is like a practice cast. It throws the line right back where it is. This is the cast you should do over and over again when you're, when you're making your practices. It has everything involved in a spade cast that we, that we have. It has the lift, right? It has the formation of the D-loop, and it has the forward stroke, and that's basically all a switch cast is, okay? So when I'm making my, uh, my anchor placement, right, the anchor will drop as soon as I lift the rod. So if I lift the rod early, like this, I get my anchor way out front, okay? If I lift the rod appropriately to the side of me, the anchor's to the side of me. If I lift the rod late, the anchor's behind me. And did you see how I walk that anchor back each time? I'll do it again. So I leave the anchor out in front of me, cast it. I leave the anchor to the side of me, cast it. I leave the anchor 
way back behind me and cast it. Now there's three different casts with three different anchor placements, but we've all been told the anchor has to be right here, right? So it doesn't always have to be right there. For optimum results, yes. Let's take a snap tee for example. I'm waiting down a really juicy run on, let's say, the Rogue or the North Umpqua, better yet, right? And um, I get down to a spot and I'm working my way down and I'm just cranking casts out and I'm just loving it. I got my timing down, you know, I've got this nice shooting head uh, that we all cast, whether it's a Scandi or a Skagit, it's all the same thing. I got the same amount of line, I'm stripping in three times and then I'm stripping in two times. So I'm shooting the same amount of line every time and everything is just beautiful. Walking down, may let that one swing out, take my steps. All of a sudden there's a giant rock and that giant rock is right here. A rod links away, right? Just off my right shoulder, right in the middle of my train tracks. What do I do? Take two more steps down and skip that spot? Well, what if that's where the 10 pounder is, right? Try to lengthen a little bit of line and you know, lose my mojo because I'm landing this fly three inches from the far bank every time, boom, 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 right? I don't want to mess with any of that. So if I can mess with that anchor placement, if I'm throwing that snap T, it's the same thing as the switch cast, right? So whether you do a circle cast or a snap T, I'm gonna start with the snap T. If you snap soon, right, you get an anchor placement right here, real close. If I snap late, I get an anchor placement way upstream, way far away, right? So I can vary where the path of my rod is during the forward stroke in order to get as close as I can to those train tracks, even though my anchor placement is not exactly where it needs to be. And I'll show you what I mean. So let's do a normal one, right? This is, life is beautiful. Anchor placement is right to the side where it's supposed to be. Everything is great. Cast goes out, okay? If I get to a spot where I can't make that because there's a big rock there, and I have to make that anchor placement further upstream, I delay the snap, and it's way upstream, I can reach upstream to try to get as close to those train tracks as I can, and I can still make that cast, okay? So is it optimum? No. Did that one throw a tailing loop? Yes. So it's not always the best, but what we can do is kind of vary those things. And what happened with that cast was when I threw that forward stroke, right? I reached way up here and I got in line with it. And because I was just a little bit off this way, right? When my anchor placement came off the water, it had energy going towards my forward cast. So that's the reason for the train tracks. Because if it's all together this way, everything turns over straight. The further you separate that between your anchor placement and your forward stroke, the more energy has to come from the anchor placement all the way over here. And that energy is traveling sideways. So sometimes the fly will jump out and hit your line and you'll get that tailing loop or a cross loop. So when you're casting on your own, you see those things happen, try to think about that. Like one of the things uh, that's the best um, thing you can do in spade casting is you have to be able to move on your feet, right? Because nothing's gonna be perfect all the time. Um, if I land this short this way, right? I know I have to get 180 degrees from there. Well, I gotta turn this thing all the way around like this, right? So if it rips off, I can do a couple of things. Everybody know what a peri poke is, right? Is that, a, is that a good viable cast, something you throw all the time? Or is it to correct mistakes, right? Peri poke is great to correct mistakes, okay? But if you can think on your feet, you don't always need it. So if I make a real bad anchor up there, I just reach upstream and I can still make my cast. I didn't have to wait. I didn't have to dump the line back down, wait for it to drift into the right spot and then throw it. I just went ahead and went, right? The guy who has the fly swinging in the run the most wins, right? Bill Shatt, he cut his, uh, he cut his shooting, anybody know who Bill Shatt was? Famous steelheader, right? He cut his shooting heads back three feet because he realized with that full sinking shooting head that at three feet shorter, he could roll it to the surface first every time and cast it back out, right? Where some guys, once in a while, it would take them two roll casts to get it up. And he figured out that at a little bit shorter, so he'd buy one a line heavier, and then cut it shorter, and then it would roll out every time. And he was back in the water, back in the water, back in the water. So <clears throat> when you're spay casting, you wanna think about that same thing. Um, how about if my anchor placement, since we're still on that, is downstream of my target? Now what do I have to do? What would most of us do? Start over, Start over right? So <clears throat> when we're talking about um, 
I'll try to do it straight out so you guys can see it right over here this, this way. When we're talking about the train tracks, remember the reason for that is because we get a cross loop, right? So if my anchor is downstream of my target and I try to cast this out, it's gonna cross up every time, right? If it doesn't cross up on the rod like that one, then it'll cross up uh, out river and sometimes hook the fly line and get stuck. I can cheat that, right? This is one of the rules I can absolutely break, okay? So if I throw this anchor and it's too far downstream, I can rip this around anyway and I can make a sidearm cast and it keeps the line away from itself, okay? I can absolutely cast right over the top of where my anchor is Anchor's right in front of me, sidearm cast, and she still goes out, okay? So what I did is instead of the energy coming across this way, I sent the energy like this, right? So when this anchor comes off, it's gonna stay underneath. So it can go all around here all the way it wants. If I were to throw that forward cast straight up, it's gonna go straight into it. You guys all follow that? There's a reason for that, and here's the reason. One of my favorite casts, okay? So we all know the circle cast, right? And the circle cast is really a slowed down version of the snap T, okay? So the circle cast is a big circle around your target, and then you form the D loop, and then out you go. Well, that was uh, developed uh, in order to slow down the process of teaching the snap T, which is just a real quick snap like this. It's almost real similar, right? It, there's a little bit of a curve in that snap as it goes. Well, if I underpower that snap, because let's say I have a great big hanging tree right here, okay? So there's a hanging tree right here. I can't wait out much deeper. Um, you know, I forgot to wear my boots with my spikes. Things are getting dangerous. I don't want to get out there too far. And I've got a big obstacle in my way right here. Well, we go back to that thought process. I don't want to skip it, right? I've already worked my way down this far. I don't want to skip this next spot. So the snap Z is an underpowered snap. And I don't know if you can see this in the light, but the line will land in a formation of a Z, right? So my leader is still straight downstream. It didn't turn over. And then I've got this big loop that comes back and then my rod, and that's what forms that Z. So I'll show it to you one more time. Here's the normal one. Leader kicks all the way over, right? If I underpower it, like this one, leader lands on the water, right? So now, if I want to make this cast across there, I snap short, I lift around, and out she goes with that sidearm forward cast. I can cast right over the top of that leader, right over the top of that anchor. And I'll do it real quick right here so you guys can see behind me. So watch behind me and let me know how much line is behind me. Any line behind me? Zero, right? So I can have that big overhanging brush and all that stuff there and I can still make that cast, right? So <clears throat> trying to remember that there are more than one ways to skin a cat if I turn this thing all the way over, try to make that same angled cast. If I turn this thing all the way over, I have to turn the anchor so I don't get a bloody L, and I had almost the whole head behind me with the D-loop that time, right? And it's gonna get all wrapped up in that big overhanging tree. So being able to vary where you put your anchor point is super important, and it's one of the rules that we can bend. Um, being able to vary your forward stroke to get away with casting over the top of your anchor is another rule we can bend. I can reach this straight up here like this and just throw an underhand cast and it all turns over. Is that gonna make it to the far side of the river? No, because it's not optimum, right? So I want you to think about what's optimum is all the things that we've been told, right? What gets you in the water and keeps you swinging down through a run when it gets tricky on the banks are all these little, all these little tricks and all these little, all these little things that we can do. The fly line follows the tip of the rod, okay? So in knowing that, we can do all kinds of things. So what we need is an anchor uh, that is in a semi-straight line uh, pointing towards our target, fly last, so there's no bloody L. Everybody know what a bloody L is? So when the leader looks like this and you're trying to cast it. And the reason that we don't do that is because if I don't turn that leader over, when I get to here, you see I lose energy. It tries to pull that leader up. So we want that leader to roll out, just like a roll cast would, where it rolls off the water. And if we leave it to the side like this, even though I make my D-loop, once it hits that leader that's to the side, it loses energy. So if I'm trying to crank out, I can't do it, okay? So 
once the fly line follows the tip of the rod, I can literally do like crazy corkscrew stuff and put everything right where I want to. You can, you know, jam it up in the air and swing it all the way around and get it there. Um, you can do all kinds of crazy stuff once you understand that, right? So why would I do this stuff? Well, if I'm doing a single spay and that's all I know, um, and I'm trying to cast this out and get a nice 45 degree angle and everything is working perfect, right? But let's say I want to get a little more sink rate. What if I want a faster presentation, right? So if I angle everything down, we all know that that's going to be a nice slow swing, right? If I throw a big upstream mend on it, it's going to be even slower. But what if I want a faster swing? What if I want a faster skate? What if I know there's a fish 20 feet down in that ledge rock, and if I really piss him off, he's going to come up and eat my mouse, right? So if I want to do that, I want to try and get this fly and this line way up here like this, maybe even put a downstream mend on it and really skate it across there. I might even give it a little twitch like this or a little twitch like this as it's coming across, right? Really chugging the water, making some, making some motion, okay? So when I do that, one of the difficult parts about that single spay is that as I change directions more gradually, we're putting out fires this morning, as I change directions more, gra uh, more and more uh, drastically, I have to get that line to come all the way around, right? So here it's almost easy. I don't even have to do anything really. I just point 45 degrees and I just make that switch cast and it works out, okay? But as I increase, if I try to do 90 and I try to do that, it's not gonna work. This line's gonna come right down in front of me. It crashed, the leader went upstream, terrible. So I have to lift, I have to bring the rod around, and eventually I have to turn it in the air and get it to land in all those parameters, right? Anchor where it's supposed to be, everything in a line, D-loop 180 and all that. So what I can do instead, because I know that the fly line follows what? The rod tip, right? So if I just say, well, geez, I really need this line to kind of come over to my other side like this, go straight and then form a D-loop and out she goes, I can do that cast. Now what I can do is I can change directions so drastically, not that I'd ever do this with a two-handed rod, but I can actually cast it upstream with a nice single spay. It's very efficient. It's very back in the water. It's touch and go cast, right? It's boom, boom, boom like this. This is something I'll do with a dry fly and a single hand rod to get it back up river like that because once it's flying through the air, regardless of single hand, two hand cast, right? Now I can incorporate things like a big reach cast as it goes up in the air. I can do that with a single hand rod and it's beautiful, okay? But just remembering that at some point, no matter what you're doing to get the line off the water, whether it's just a big lift like I did there or it's some kind of snake roll thing, the last thing that you have to do, right, is make sure that you draw the anchor straight and come up into a D loop. Everything before that, you can do whatever you want. That's the beauty of it, right? That's what's so fun about fly casting and spay casting. Learning those parameters, learning those rules, and then saying, what can I do to kind of bend that rule? Get that anchor right in front of me. Sidearm cast, and I can get it out. Zero line behind me. So any kind of overhanging structure, any kind of rocks in my way, I can vary that, uh, that anchor placement. And lastly, shooting line, right? Trying to, you know, re oh, he ate my bug. <laughs> Lastly, shooting line. So if I want to shoot this line out, right, um, one of the things that we want to do, uh, Simon uh, had something yesterday from Rio that was really cool. It was, a, it was a colored line, and it was like every five feet, I think it was, or maybe ten, um, the line changed colors so that you knew, you know, what, what was going on out there, and you knew how long it was. That way, if you did hook a fish or lost it or landed or whatever, you could walk right back to the same spot pull out the same amount of line you had and continue fishing the run. Because some of these runs are giant, right? So when we catch a fish up at the top, we want to start right where we started and see if there's any more along the way. They like to travel in groups, right? So what I do is I just count. So I'll do four strips, and then I'll do three strips, and then however far I'm casting out, like there's two more strips. And then I hold those loops that way. And so I know how much line I have out, and each time I do the same thing as I'm working my way down. Four strips, three strips, two strips, go four strips, three strips, two strips. Wow, it's hard to say this morning. It's a late night. So if I want to get as far as I can, where should my anchor be? Now remember, we're thinking outside the box here, right? Not optimum, but where should my anchor be if I want to cast it as far as I can? Anybody? 
What was that? Right beside, right beside me. Anybody else? Okay, what's, what's the easiest? Dax wants to answer. Yeah, far behind me, right? So he's pointing up this way. Because the more line I have behind the rod, right, the more it's going to load, the farther I can cast, right? Casting is nothing more than loading this rod right here, putting a bend in it. Boom. If I put a bend in this rod and stop it, out she goes, right? That's all it is. So if I have my anchor way down in front of me like this, collapsing, right? Line shot out because it's really slick line, but the loop itself is collapsing, okay? So if I have it where it's supposed to be, right here beside me, pretty good, aside for the tailing loop. But you bring it right here to the side of you, out she goes, okay? If I get it behind me, not a lot, mind you, just cheating a little bit. Even more energy. You see how there was more and more energy in that cast? What about one further? How much room do I have behind me? All the room in the world? Okay, it's just a fly line. It's just a fly rod and just a fly line. If you got all the room in the world, that's the farthest cast you can make. Chuck that thing behind you and go. It's just a fly rod, right? We don't always have to make a spade cast with it, right? We can make all kinds of different casts if we remember that the fly line follows the tip of the rod, and at some point I need an anchor somewhere up, up around where it needs to be, and the forward stroke needs to be somehow in a similar line than the anchor direction. You guys all follow that, right? It's, it's different, right? It's a different way of thinking, but in fishing, it's super important. How about if I have a big wind in front of me? I'm trying to cast this out this way, I'm doing my snap tee, and that wind is just barreling in this way. I'm getting the line out pretty good uh, because, you know, I got a nice tight loop, and it's shooting out into that, into that wind, and it's turning over. But the scary part that's happening right now, if you can imagine with me on this early morning, the scary part is when I do this snap with my intruder and my lead eyes, that wind is blowing this line towards me, right? If that wind is blowing this line towards me, that's becoming more and more difficult, right? So I don't like that. Uh, so maybe I do a cat handed double spay, right? Leave the fly out there away from me so it doesn't have to come in front of me, right? Yeah, that's okay, but none of us are as good cat handed as we are regular handed, right? And so <clears throat> what I can do is remember that the fly line follows the tip of the rod and I can just let that wind blow it right behind me so it's not blowing it into me. And as long as it lands in the same position as it would have if I did a circle cast, everything is beautiful. You guys see that? So that's real easy. That's a, re that's a real easy one. So you got it. So if I'm doing this and this line is being blown into me, all I need is for the line to land in this position. Well, if I just bring it this way behind my back and around, it's going to land in that same position. The wind can blow it that way all at once because it's behind me and it's not going to hit me if I have plenty of room with no trees or obstacles behind me. So that's a, really, that's a really good trick too, right? If the wind is coming from my casting side, so we got a downstream wind right now, we're gonna go back to that anchor placement and that's how we're gonna deal with that. So I got a big downstream wind here, right? I could throw it cat handed, but the, the wind that's not that bad, right? So I could probably get away with it a little bit, but if I'm doing a, a snap or a single spay and this is blowing towards me, right? Um, just like you would do with current, when you are compensating for current, you kind of get your line up there, get your rod tip up there, and you can deal with it a little bit. Does that make sense? Right, to a point. So if it's coming up this way, I can kind of just throw everything out a little bit further. I kept my rod tip way out there to try and get as close to those train tracks as I can, and I still get a pretty decent cast on the way out there. So varying those few things um, will help you in your fishing, knowing that if in your practice, when the steelhead aren't swimming, I practice putting my anchor here, I practice putting my anchor short, and I practice putting my anchor long. And if I can do those three things, once I get out on the water, right, I can vary that placement and it'll, none of these obstacles, whether they be logs, trees, limbs, overhanging trees, nothing of that will ever bother me from getting that fly out and continuing the swing down the run. Because really what we're trying to do is sweep that run, right? 
We're not trying to cast into one spot. We're not fishing pocket water for trout. We're trying to cover this whole run and show the fly to every inch of that. So the more I can do here to make sure that I can compensate for any obstacles I have, the better I'm gonna swing and the more time my fly is gonna be spent swimming across that current and going. So um, that's pretty much uh, some of the tricks that I wanted to show you guys uh, as far as what you can do differently on the water to get around some of the obstacles that we face. Are there any questions about spay casting in general or any of the things I just showed you?